Happy Tuesday, guys. Welcome back to Unlocked. I'm so excited because I have Jason Waller on. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, when you pulled up, I was like, shoot, why didn't I have Ashley on too? I, uh, you should have. I you know. You have to have her on next time. I know. I will. So for those that don't know, Ashley is Jason's wife. Yes. Okay. So you were on the hills. Yes. And let's talk about that. What was the timeline of that? Well, so prior to the hills was actually Laguna Beach. Okay, yeah. So a lot of these are like before my time. Okay. Yeah. yeah I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> no, I, it's crazy. I mean, Laguna Beach was all the way back in 2005. And wow. so it has been, dude, it's almost been 20 years uh, since that whole thing came out, which is absolutely nuts. And, and just to see how, you know, how much it's transitioned from then to where we're at today. Yeah. I was actually just on a show earlier talking about this and it's like back when Laguna was on, it was just cable television. Mm -hmm. There was no Instagram. There was no Facebook. There was no, there it was, was like the OG of reality television. It, 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 I mean, technically it was, yeah. and it was, I mean, I think it, you know, Laguna is one of those shows that like really revolutionized the way that reality television was done. Mm -hmm. Um, like that soft docu scripted type of show. And, um, but yeah, it was a blast in the past, man. It was went from Laguna to the Hills. And then I ended up on celebrity rehab. So you can see that nice trajection, you know, <laughs> nice. just the nice up and down. So, um, it was, it was a very interesting, um, you know, it was, geez, 10, 10, 11 years of my life. Wow. Yeah. So obviously you said went from Laguna to celebrity rehab and yeah. what a lot of people have learned over the years is your struggle with addiction and how you've kind of just the ups and downs of it all and how it's not just you struggle and then you get better yes. and that's it a hundred percent i mean you know i i share with people is like even going into the sh the show prior like i i identify and after doing 20 years of work now mm -hmm. you know i can actually see that i struggled with addiction way before i ever picked up a drink or a drug and really? what i mean by that is as at 12 13 years old i had a very very uh, severe OCD where I would wash my hands so they'd bleed. Uh, and then I'd have to wear neoprene, glo neoprene gloves at night with neosporin in them to, to help moisturize my hands. And so there's, there's that piece. And on the outs, on the other side, that was what was going on behind closed doors. And on the other side, I was, you know, athletic, I was a popular kid and yeah. I was kind of like living this double life at that age. But, um, when you look at it, I was really dealing with this, the, the depression, the anxiety. I mean, I thought all sorts of things were wrong with me. And too, um, back in that time, the mental health was not spoken about. No. And, and my parents took me to the to psychiatrist doctors. You know, I, I saw everybody that I possibly could, but you know, and I got put on an SSRI. Um, and what's that? It's, it's basically antidepressant okay. um, that helped mitigate the symptoms. And I didn't do the underlying work that I needed to do, um, which ultimately ended up leading me into addiction. Um, mm. And so there was a lot that was, was there, but even as a 12 or 13 year old kid, like I didn't know how to talk about that. Like even, even putting myself back in that day, like looking at it, like, even being able to explain kind of what was going on, I didn't have the vocabulary to vocalize like what was actually happening, mm -hmm. right? And so um, later on, you know, come before even before the shows and stuff, I find alcohol and it, it, it alleviated a lot of those those symptoms that I couldn't address or, yeah. or it made me feel invisible. For right? sure, but would you say, and I guess the way, the reason I asked this is because, I mean, I started reality television at 15 and there were so many opportunities of like, I remember being invited to a party. I was probably, 17 and i was invited to a party of justin bieber's and i was like heck yeah you know and i was like okay maybe this is not the best idea but it's so easy to fall into the yes. party lifestyle a hundred percent well i mean like i always would joke about it. it's like you know at 18 most of your friends are looking for you know fake ids we we're mm -hmm. being paid to party and travel the world like yes. i mean like you know we were living the dream mm -hmm. which obviously for me ended up becoming the biggest nightmare but the access you know i don't blame the entertainment business for my addiction i was pre-genetically disposed i mean i'm mm -hmm. cherokee german and irish i was screwed from when i came out of the womb <laughs> Um, you know, and, and for me on, on that end, it's, you know, it, it definitely added fuel to the fire. Yeah. Cause um, it just made things well, more accessible. Well, yeah. But, and then also being in the, the, the limelight, I mean, one of the things I always identified with is I always had this overinflated ego with an underestimated sense of self-worth. And what I mean by that is, is I wanted you to, I wanted what you saw on the outside is what I wanted you to believe how I felt internally, which was not the case. Yes. And that, so was, I literally say that all the time, like I'll post stuff on Instagram and someone asked me, they were like, but do you really believe what you post? I was like, well, I want you to believe it. <laughs> like I so badly wished I believed this about myself or about whatever, but yeah. I'm not at that place yet. So it's, you make people seem it's my therapist described it best. It's like high functioning depression. Yeah. 
Like 100%. you on the outside, everyone thinks your life's great. You're doing amazing. And then on the inside is when you struggle. What's well, that internal battle? Yeah. And that's where, again, as I, it, it just got elevated through the shows and through, mm-hmm. you know, the career, if you will, and the more entertainment money business, and more, more, more access, more notoriety. Uh, it just fueled the fire and it deflected from being able to take an internal look of what was really going on. And that was the true struggle, what was really going on underneath. And, you know, I was, um, it was actually just with on, on Access Hollywood because we did an 18 year, re, 18 year like reunion Holy of stuff. Cow. And she asked just about being on the show and like what it was like and, and just that whole process. But like after Netflix picked it back up, me and Ashley watched a couple of episodes, it's like laughing at it. Yeah. But when I really looked at it, you got to see somebody who's just really, really sick. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? After, like from the perspective of when it was really a character, you yeah. know, 15, 20 years ago to now, I'm like, dude, you were. A, 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 you are a sick, sick individual. Like well, this is really with thing. addiction, mental health, all the yes. different stuff that I was struggling with, but didn't. So I guess the good news to that is we've made tremendous strides to see, you know, just in the last 15 to 20 years, I think we could, could continue to do more. Yeah. Well, um, just like you say on the show, now you look at it and you're like, that's someone that really, I'm going through that right now in my life with just a few people and people are like, oh yeah, like they're so fun to party with. Like, let's go do a shot. Let's go do this. And I'm like, but you if you knew this person well enough, you would know that they're not, when they're doing great, they're not up at all hours of the morning, drinking and partying. They're getting ready to go to the gym and they're getting ready to do all these different things. So the person that you're describing isn't the person that I know. Correct. A hundred percent. And I think that's, again, seeing what's going on behind closed doors, yeah. right? And what somebody does and what somebody's going through. And that's the thing too, is, I mean, as in high school, I was like life of the party, right? Yep. And, it, and I, I wanted to live up by that because it was a deflection from what I had to deal with internally, the the shame, the guilt, the, you know, the self-hatred against my existence, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, and so was, when would you say the addiction really start? Like, obviously you said as a child, but in your adult life, did it start as just more drinking this, or? Yeah. So prior to like the, you know, the OCD and like the mental health components, which again, it's a, a variant that adds into yes. the alcoholism, right? So like the, there's that piece started about 12, 13, 14 years old. And then the addiction really started to kick off with the actual substances. Mm-hmm. I'd say like by 17 is yeah. when it started to become problematic. And I mean, to yeah. the point where I had to go to boarding school and, and I went to wilderness. I went out into the middle of Provo, Utah, this program. It was called like walkabout where I had to make my own, like whittle my own backpack, and like make a spoon. My <laughs> Literally my dad sent my oldest, like half brother to that same, it was in Utah. Yeah. And like they, there was a parents night or whatever. And like the parents had to go sleep out there. My dad was like, are you effing kidding me? Dude. Like he was like, he in this like, <laughs> sleeping bag and he's like there's ice all in the front he like snuck a coke at Reese's Cups out there he's like it all froze yeah, it's it was it was so funny like I mean I actually which is is interesting I, I obviously love nature I mean because it was a, it was a, an experience but I actually like really enjoyed it. And it was the first time too, like where I had like my tin cup and I'd look every morning, like it was growing my first mustache. I was like, yeah, dude, things coming in. <laughs> so like, I felt like I was a wilderness person because I was there like 21 days, which seemed like six months yeah. at the time. Right. Um, but uh, from there and then going to boarding school and, and, but that's when it really started to, uh, you know, struggle from 18 to 23. Uh, you know, I'd gone to 12 different treatment centers, was arrested half a dozen times, you know, just went through the, the gamut. Uh, 18 now to was that, was going to those facilities, was that a choice of yours or was it your family? Great question. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, it's like starting with, with uh, uh, the, the, that is the <laughs> the program out in the wilderness and then like the boarding school was a collective agreement with the family like hey i'm struggling with school like i'm, I'm not going i'm yeah. like at the beach all the time and <laughs> i was like doing that to kind of get my parents off but i also was like I'd be, this could be good for me right yeah. so like i was motivated manipulated my way i was only gone for like a total of four months it was supposed to be a year okay uh, came back and then like the the first you know few treatment centers it was to appease girlfriends courts you know different mm-hmm. things and i'd say as time went on, I started to really see, cause it was hard though, still, even with everything going on, right? Addiction is a disease of denial. Yeah. And so even though I was getting arrested and things were, I was like, nah, this happens to everybody my age, you know, but 18, 19, 20, it wasn't even a legal age to drink. to drink. And I'm like, I can't be struggling with this. You know, it's like, I just not, I need to tone it down. And, but again, that's just how blinded I was by all of this. And obviously I can look back today and be like, dude, you needed help like yeah. for sure. But it wasn't until the latter stages where I was really in a place of acceptance um, and wanting to get help. But I mean, my disease not took not only took me to contemplation, but attempting suicide, you know? And so it was a, a very uh, cunning, baffling, and powerful uh, 
disease that, that addiction is and it takes you and it robs you of of everything now because i listened to another podcast that you did and you spoke about contemplating or actually attempting suicide yes and that was before you and ashley had met correct that, that was, was before you guys before had met. met and did you kind of look at now looking at it because you how how many years at sober are you right now so right now i'll be coming up back on four years so i okay. originally got sober july 23rd 2010 had about five years of sobriety okay. relapse which is a, a really gnarly story that's what i'm hoping you'll have a conversation yeah. with ashley about so ashley met yeah. me sober uh and then five years into it it went off the rails and do um, you look at that suicide attempt though and like now and are you like how did that not jolt me into like never doing this again or never I know what you're saying and I and and when you're in that state mm -hmm. it's again is is there's there's different levels and variants of this like I look at addiction is there's like stages one two three and four like cancer right yeah um and just again they're totally separate I'm not comparing the yeah. two but I'm just using it as an analogy and when you're like in that stage four alcoholism like it's like I look back now and I could see that but yeah. I also understand how sick I was and there was so much work that needed to be done that it's not mm -hmm. just as simple as like that you know that turning that turning point uh it could be a key indicator to to getting help to be on the on a journey to get to get better yeah um but to have that be like that triggering moment and some people have that some people have this this yeah. aha moment my aha moment was it was sitting in a therapist office so it was completely different some than from some very traumatic event that had happened because there's a lot of things that had happened in my life from the arrest, the fights that, I mean, there are a lot of different stuff we don't have yeah. time to talk about. Um, you would have been like, that would have changed. That would have changed your trajectory and wanted to, to pivot. And I think yeah. they all happened. And I think those were, those added value to, uh, to my story. Cause I think like something for me is like your greatest deficits become your greatest assets. Right. And I, mm -hmm. I like live by that because all these experiences that I've gone through, there's a lot of things that I, I had a lot of shame and guilt and I, I wish I didn't do, but I'm also grateful that I was able to experience and work through. Yeah. Them. Well, was that part of your healing process? Like when you became sober the first time for five years, did you find yourself having to apologize to people and to 100%. say like, I wish I wouldn't have done this or that? Because what a lot of people don't realize that don't deal with this in their family is like, you it's like mass destruction all around it affects everybody around you you know what i mean and so i mean it was that whole that whole process of of going through that was uh i mean just like looking at like what it did to our my family i mean it just it it, it robbed everybody you mm -hmm. know what i mean and there's also some codependency factors and things in there and that's where i think it'd be fascinating for you to talk to ash is because wherever there is an alcoholic there's a codependent and sometimes they're just as sick if not sicker and so 100%. understanding the disease and and uh, what it is that person's going through is 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 important, but it's getting education around it because I always tell people like addiction doesn't dictate who we are, but it doesn't justify our mm -hmm. actions, right? But it's having a better understanding of what that person's going through because there is no such thing as recreation use of meth. There's no yeah. such thing as recreation use of, of heroin or drinking yeah. a bottle of vodka a day. It's like if somebody's in that state of mind and they're going through what it is that they're going through, it's like if they have to do that on a daily basis, that's a pretty miserable existence. Yeah, 100%. Right? And I think what's so hard too is like being a family member of that because he's my oldest brother hardcore drugs, bipolar, all the different things. And I remember as a child, like that completely robbed us of our childhood because it's riding around with dad at two o'clock in the morning, trying to pull him out of a crack house, whatever it may be. Yep. And like, that's what it does. Correct. But then, you know, I look at it and I'm like, well, and even like Chase has come on my podcast and talked about like struggling with alcohol and all these different things. And I'm like, but I can go out and have a drink or yeah. I can have like a glass of wine and I'm fine. But Chase, my brother, where we came from the same people, he can't. So at times it does worry me. And I'm like, well, if he's just like predisposed to that, am I too? And that's, that's a very, very good question. I mean, is there, again, we can go down a whole thing yeah. of that. Is there a history within your family? You know, there's a lot of different factors that, that can come into this. I mean, there's the pregenetic disposition, mm -hmm. there's environmental, there's trauma. There's a lot of things that can, that can, yeah. that can come in and, and play that out. But it's, it's like, for me, half my family struggles with some form of addiction and or mental health. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, uh, for on our side though, is there's definitely pregenetic disposition to yeah. it, but also certain events and, or, you know, environment or trauma can definitely exacerbate and, or, you know, ex excel that process yeah. or speed that up. For sure. So when you, you were sober five years yes. and then when you relapsed, what 
caused that relapse, would you say? Great, great question. And so when I had that five years of sobriety, basically everything that I had done to get that five years, I stopped doing. And so mm. uh, in, in the simplest form, my program that I have, and that's different for every single person, um, I ended up getting distracted with worldly things and and what was really important, right? I mean, just work, money, whatever it may have been. Because at that by that point, you had to have been like, "Well, I'm good now." To a degree, yes, yeah. right. But I also I got sober at 23 years old and still had a lot to learn. And I think as I went through this, as I went through the motions and the things that I was going through, there was still going through that relapse. It was very apparent that there was still more that I needed to discover. Mm -hmm. um, but going through that, uh, it, it was basically. I ended up going back out on Adderall um, and it was not, it was God honest truth. It was not intentional. There's a whole story behind that uh, to met with my psychologist, basically told him everything that was going on. Um, he's like, Hey, let's get you back in Adderall. You took it when you're young. Uh, somebody that loved cocaine, probably not the best thing to put him yeah, on, no. uh, you know, end up, you know, within a month or two, uh, you know, the stories I always <laughs> get prescri I got prescription dyslexia instead of taking one every eight hours, take eight every one hours. And, and mm. this was off to the races was in that for about a year on and off. Right. It was, I would be sober for 30 days back, back forth, back forth. Biggest problem is I wasn't willing to get open and honest. I was not willing to share or tell what was really going on. And at this time you and Ashley were together. together. We were together. So we're together five years. So we met, uh, we actually met right around my one year of sobriety. So in July uh -huh. 23rd, like, so we've, we we're coming up on 10 years of marriage tomorrow. That's a congratulations. Uh, thank you. And so we've been together 12, 13 years. Sorry, Ashley, I don't remember the exact, I know our, our <laughs> wedding anniversary, 10, 12, 13, easy to remember. Um, I tried doing 11, 12, 13, so I would definitely never forget. I know, but, right? Yeah, right. Um, but going through that, uh, and that's the problem is she met me, she knew my history, but she didn't, she never got a, she never saw the wrath, if yeah. you will. And so it was, it, so her and, and naturally she's a codependent. And so when I started using and stuff and as she started to find, you know, uncover and discover months and months later that this was going on, and that's the scariest part. When I drank and used before, it was, you knew, it was like guaranteed yeah. nine out of 10 times I'd get in trouble. This time I was hiding it from everybody. Ashley ends up finding out. Um, and then I start, you know, I get a drug induced psychosis, I get sleep deprivation. I start drinking now. So now it's like after a year, now this thing just starts to, to keep building, mm -hmm. right? It's primary chronic progressive. And, and she even spoke in the podcast I listened to that she knit, when she walked out into your garage and there was alcohol oh, yeah. and you had said it was it's our neighbors, the next door neighbor. Yeah. And she was like, I wanted to believe it, but in my gut, I knew that wasn't right, but she didn't confront it. No, and, and it was not having the tools or this, you know, the, the wherewithal or the skills to do that. And you, it may seem like, well, it's very obvious. You just address it again is, mm -hmm. is the codependent, it's its own thing, enabling it's its own it's thing. It's its own thing. And you have this fear of, well, are they going to be mad at me? Are they going to leave me? Are they, even though and you're I not would, the one in the wrong. And I would leverage that to manipulate as, the as, situation. Again, as an, when an active addiction, you know, you, you do what you can to continue doing what you're doing. Yeah. And so you manipulate the situation. So even if she, when it got to the point a month or two later, when she knew it was mine, she saw me drinking it. Oh, yeah. it's not mine. I yeah. would, you know, I would manipulate the situation. All jokes aside, like, I mean, it's, I can, you know, laugh about it now because of all the work that we've done, but it was like, that's just how sickening it is. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you're blatantly lying right to somebody in their face. Like, um, you know, I'd be eating a hot dog telling you I was having a hamburger. You know, it was just like I never knew what the truth was. So, um, which it, is sad because it does when you get in that groove of things to the other person, it's like, wait, well, are they telling the truth? Like, well, like, because you're is, so, you have such conviction about your truth. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's, but the, the craziest thing about this is like, I call addiction like a survival gene. And the, the way I try to relate that to somebody that's a normie, call you yeah. people normie who can enjoy yourselves, um, is, is think of when, and some of these may be ridiculous, but it's the only thing I could relate to, to that feeling. Think yeah. of when you've had to pee so bad, like yep. that's all you think about, or think of when you're dying of thirst. Mm -hmm. Think of that, but translate that towards a substance. That's what an addict mm -hmm. goes through. Is it, I'd be sitting here drinking, pounding vodka, crying, saying I don't want to do it anymore. I, 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 and people would be just, just set the bottle down. It's like a survival gene. It's like it, all you're doing is constantly going after that until you can disrupt that cycle. That's just how powerful it is. And that, when I've shared that with people that don't understand, like my dad, he's like, I just don't get it. And right. I've shared it with him like that. He's like, I still don't get it, but I can comprehend now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I understand, thank you for pairing those two together. Well, it's even so. just like caffeine or sugar. Like I wake up every morning and drink a Dr. Pepper. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's like my thing. Right. But, and it's, it's the exact same feeling that you're 
stating you yeah. with coffee or with whatever it may be it's the exact same thing and it's 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 like you know like think like and i want to get back to the the relapse but i think like when you look at addiction and and what it is you're willing to sacrifice everything for one thing think about that mm. and you're and to to on the other end is you could give up one thing to have everything that's how gnarly addiction is mm. right when you, i'm like it gives me chills thinking about it because it is you I lost it's, everything. Yeah. Well, and you, cause then you spoke about your addiction, not only with Adderall, alcohol, gambling, all of it, that, and it, that, and I look at it and I look at Ashley and I'm like, how the hell did you do it? Like, she's a wizard. Did she, was there a point in time to where she looked at you and said, I can't do this with you anymore. I have to walk away. So yes, get this. Um, so after all this had happened, <clears throat> uh, I had like a mini intervention base, like a, a mini one, uh, and she's nine months pregnant. I mm -hmm. end up going to the first floor at Hogue Hospital, detoxing. Next day, she's above me on the fourth floor giving birth to our daughter. So I was in detox when that happened. I was able to go up and be there for the whole process. Yeah. Again, like I can actually technically say I was, I think I was in detox two days prior to her coming in. Um, you know, did not actively arrest the disease, did not get stabilized. Went home a week, you know, after the baby, went home five days later, right? Whatever it was, I was with her the whole time. Went back at it again um, for like f four or five months. Uh, and then she got to a place and when where- when you say went back at it for four Adder or five months. Adderall, I mean, just, cause I didn't, I never stabilized. Yeah. And so again, having some, you know, again, like how could you do that? Again, goes back to everything we just talked about. Like, yeah. obviously I love my family more than anything, but- Oh, anyone is, that is, like watches you guys, it's like, it, it's it's crazy so but going back to the state is while having the, the a newborn she was able to again and she was prior to that too she started going to Al-Anon started going to a therapist started getting help and guidance and direction I came home one day and uh my parents my sponsor a couple friends were there and uh by her doing the work that she needed to do over that six to nine she'll, she'll be able to tell you more I think it was yeah. six to nine months before that all happened so she started slowly implementing her program saved my life and um um because i knew at that point it was it was over now because again remember nobody knew like i was working with with dr drew i was working with dr hedrick i was working with all these people because she had she had hit it from everyone as well correct but that's the family everybody yeah. but i also was able to mask i i like perfected how to use like which was this i break off a quarter of an adderall take an airplane shooter nobody would know it was going like it was this most I can sick do x amount of time before and then it'll last me this long it was and, a full-time job yeah and um even though like i mean at home i'd completely unravel right i mean i'd be mm -hmm. pounding vodka and and all these different things poor like again, poor Ashley with all the stuff that she had to experience. And, uh, but do this, you think it brought you closer in the end? A hundred percent because I mean, you know, and all, the fact all, that she did not walk away because most, most people I feel like would have just been like, I'm done. Yeah. Like a hundred percent. I, I even told her that. Done. I've even told her that, but yeah. I think all great change proceeds through chaos. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think by us going through what we went through, it's a lot us this opportunity to be able to help like is it, 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 many more people right because it's, it is anything worth having is not easy and, yeah. and again as i'm not it, there are people that are in a situation where they have to leave but for us it is it's created us this opportunity and platform to share on our experience not only from the addict's perspective but the codependent's perspective and how they go hand yeah. in hand and too she spoke on the podcast she was like never once was he abusive there was none of that it was ver it was more it was, verbal like i'd yeah. be very aggressive like you know just demeaning word like it was yeah you know, and, and we had to work through that i mean we've had we had to go to therapy we are at a place with 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 communication we couldn't have common communication. We had to have somebody that had no bias on the situation, being a therapist, to help us navigate some of the most simple conversations. That's mm -hmm. how destructful it got, and like how how close of a slither sliver was just hanging on. Yeah. And so it was, it was yes, it's definitely, uh, and that's what like I talk about God, how He works is like going through all this, and then like we went back on the hills, and like we really tried to the best of our ability utilize like we're like cause we weren't know if we were going to go back on or not, yeah. you know, or like do we want to do this? Do we not like? I've done this for so long and but it was like it was like an opportunity to shed light on what it is that we had went through and again you know tv it's yeah. not it's we we thought we were gonna have a, a different narrative and be able to explain it more but we were able to talk about sobriety we we're able to talk about recovery yeah. and i can't tell you the the thousands of people that reached out um because we after that came out we shared a lot of the story you know not necessarily on the hills but through interviews and different things yeah. and 
Um, it just, uh, it, it, I never thought people would be in the same, literally the exact same scenario. Yeah. Um, to them just, you know, just giving them hope. You know what I mean? It's letting them know they're not alone. Well, and because you've made it out on the other side now. Yeah. This episode of Unlocked is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June of 2022 and May of 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. But now with being four years sober, does it worry you as that five-year mark comes up? Why are you throwing that question out there? <laughs> um, you know, n honestly, I don't, I, I feel like I'm in such a different place in this sobriety journey than I was when I originally got sober at 23. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of work, a lot more work than I initially did in the beginning. And I, I can just naturally see with where I'm at on a day-to-day -day basis, like mm -hmm. the continuous of growth where that was kind of diminished. I think a lot of it had to do with maturing as well yeah. and, and being an adult, being a father, being a husband, you know, being a friend. Um, look, there's just because I'm sober doesn't mean my life is easy. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's definitely the, the ebbs and flows, but instead of my life being like this, I want it to be more like, how do I get it more? Because balance is a mirage. That's bullshit. You can never have perfect <laughs> no, balance. Never. But it's, it, how do I have it more just like a, a, a steady, steady flow? And, and so seeing where I'm at, the constant growth, deepening my faith. I mean, I, you know, from, from, from just going to church once a week to now attending Bible studies to now doing daily devotionals to like, I just see how I'm continuing to grow in the right direction versus yeah. like going the other way like I did before. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, but I also don't want to say I have power over the disease. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, it's, it's a day-to-day -day thing and I have the opportunity in the daily reprieve that I do to, to keep the disease at rest. Mm -hmm. um, now yeah. with Ashley, does she, because I know she spoke about when you guys got together, like she didn't drink for a year or X yeah, what's time. that? It, and on, yes, yes. So that was, in my head, now that you say that, I'm like, dude, I'm gonna marry this girl. Cause like, like just when she said that, it wasn't that I necessarily needed her to stop. It was just the fact that she, she loved went on, you enough and went out on her own accord again, not having the knowledge or understanding, but that's also what a normal person and a person that doesn't depend on alcohol can do. Yeah. Right. They can well, that's what I it. said. I said to Chase, I, I drank with him one time. I was 19, maybe drank with him one time. And I said, never again, <laughs> never again. I will never forget the moment we were in Florida. We were in some club and he's going haywire. And I was like, <laughs> this is so bad. I was like, never again. And now 26 years old, I have not had a drink with him. I will not like, if I know he's at a bar, I'm not, I will not be there. I won't just cause I'm like, I, for my own sanity. I'm and you don't like, want to condone it, right? Cause yeah. if you're around it and supporting it, you're basically saying, if you're there, you're saying, Hey, I support the way you're behaving. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's the reason I like, it hits me is because I <laughs> laugh with, with like my dad, we've always like kind of our standing joke is like, he's never had a, a beer with me and my, at, at my, at a, as a legal age, like we drank one like when I was like 18 or 19. <laughs> But since I've been at 21, yes. I'm 36 now, we've never had a beer together. Yeah. Like he's like, uh, it's again, you look at that, which again, he supports and is very happy that yes, I'm sober. He does course. not want me to drink, but it's just like, that's kind of like, we hang out a lot. There's a lot of stuff that we do. And yeah. it's, we always kind of look, it's like, yeah, dude, cheers, Diet Coke, and, you know? Um, <laughs> but does she, did does Ashley drink now? Yeah. Okay. She, and she, but she's. It's like she, a glass of wine. Yeah, sure. Or, uh, yeah. Even if like in, in, in those early stages, the reason why it was so important to me is because it was like, one is to see that she understands. Because I also told her when we first met, I said, look, my sobriety is the most important thing. If I don't have that, I have nothing. And she held on to that. 
Mm-hmm. And so, and she even says that till this day. And she got to see the ramifications when I did not have my sobriety. Yeah. And so, and again, not on her. I'm just saying like, she, like when I stated that, like there's, and I truly meant that. Uh, again, lost sight, I'm not a perfect person. Um, and too, you're going, what a lot, what I've had to realize, it's like, it doesn't matter if I don't drink around you. If you want to do it, you're going to do it. It cor- doesn't like what I, d- granted, it's going to help when you're living with someone every day and they're correct. not drinking, you're not drinking, but like, if you want to do it, you're going to find a way to do it. And it was just a hundred percent, but yeah. it was also from that perspective though, living with the person and just yeah. having that support and knowing that she took what I was dealing with seriously. It because takes a I, level of... Well, because there's, there's often people, even still to this day, that yeah. just don't understand no. and they just don't have the courtesy or the decency to like, you know, could put somebody in uncomfortable. And yes, it's that person's responsibility and ownership for putting themselves in an uncomfortable situation and having mm-hmm. the ability to remove themselves. But if you care or love about somebody with a lot of people that I've talked to or that I've worked with, it's like, you guys, you just got home you know if it's a especially if it's a a kid that's coming back to his parents like you guys shouldn't be drinking around him you know what i mean like it's it's just it's common courtesy and support right to just to have that because there is uncomfortability in that and that's why it's important that you build a foundation you build a fellowship you have your own community in that process but again it's it's the more that we can educate people that don't have the disease or addiction because i'm all for people that can enjoy themselves i'm not against that it's that's it's and there's no jealousy there's yeah look it's but i'm i'm for the people that can't and that that get into that headspace that are stuck in that bondage that can't get out and it's that miserable existence like it's a horrible shitty place to be and Mm -hmm. so i'm there to advocate and try to support and help those and have those that can drink and can enjoy themselves to have a just a better understanding and knowledge of what that person's going through well see i have some friends that are like sober I mean, very sober. And you see, like, whenever you go out and someone offers a drink and they're like, oh, no, I'm good. Like, you know, I, I don't drink. And I feel like we're getting to a place in society to where it's like, oh, that's freaking awesome. Yeah. Well, I just you know? tell people I break out in handcuffs. So <laughs> hey, I'm allergic. So <laughs> I'm like, you want you want your place to burn down? Then that's a, a whole nother a whole nother story. But yes, it, it, it's it's what well, you look at. I mean, there's literally sober clubs in discussion now. There's I mean, there's every damn near every restaurant's got mocktails on it. I yep. mean, so there's there's well, a trend to it. But there's also like working with Daniel, who we both know very yep. well. His whole theory is that alcohol is actually going to be looked like as like cigarettes was in about 10 years. Yes, which I is saw that be, video, Dr. Amen. Yes. And he'd come on the podcast before. So if you haven't watched, go back and watch it because it's very informative. But he does say that, that like, and I'm scared to, because I mean, I do like to go out and like have some wine and stuff. And I'm like, but he's right because you well, see. More and more and more people, even the people that don't struggle with addiction aren't drinking anymore. Yeah. There's a lot of people that have just stopped, like that didn't have necessarily an addiction issue that mm-hmm. just want a cleaner life. And now with you being someone that struggles with addiction, what is your viewpoint on, because it came very popular, became very popular this past year or two, Demi Lovato stating this California sober lifestyle. Uh, I, I, for me personally, that is not sobriety. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, well, that's what I struggled with because I was like, but you're still smoking weed and it's a mood altering substance. And, yeah. and again is, I mean, you also have to understand too. So just for simple responses, no, I do not believe you're sober if you're, you're smoking weed and doing stuff like that. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, marijuana today too, though, we're seeing people come in that are in drug induced psychosis based on marijuana. I mean, your body, the potency of THC nowadays, it is so potent that your body can't synthesize it. And so it's Mm -hmm. putting people into schizophrenic breaks. I mean, it's, it is so gnarly to see what marijuana does. And again, as you have all the people that talk about the medical benefits, there's understand that, but these dabs and these, these, these waxes and these different concentrates that they've created, it's like going from a beer to drinking triple wild turkey you know yeah. what i mean like i don't even i can't even think of, or moonshine times 10 you know well, what that's I mean? what i say to people i'm like because weed is this cool thing and i'm like but i know someone that smoked weed and it like set off something in their brain and now full-on schizophrenic yep. and i'm like it alters your everything anything that you put in in a hydroponic thing that is this big one day and then and then three weeks later it's 15 feet tall you know it's not you know there's nothing organic about that thing yeah. so again like it's it's i'm not here to you know to 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 tell people what to do or not to do but just my own experience like when it comes to sobriety i think you know it's it's abstinence and yeah. because it affects the same receptors in your brain i mean whether it's it's adderall whether it's alcohol whether it's heroin whether whether it's marijuana yeah uh, well see i say from my own personal experience that i believe marijuana is a gateway drug and the reason I say that is because I dated a guy, I was 
17 years old. He was 23. Wannabe musician, like all these things. Smoked weed all the time. Yeah. And so then, of course, I'm like on this rebellious stage. As soon as I turn 18, I'm smoking weed all the time with him. And there came a point where it was like, wait, I find myself like wanting this, like craving this. And I was like, enough. And luckily I've got that personality where I was just able to be like, all right, no more done. Yeah. You know, done. But I wholeheartedly believe that's what I tell people all the time. I'm like, I wholeheartedly believe it's a gateway drug. hundred percent. I mean, I, I mean, look, I think there's, I think you can too much of anything's not good. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the other thing is I think I, I genuinely think everybody's addicted to something. Mm-hmm. Um, when you really look at it, whether that's work, whether that's sex, whether that's drugs, whether that's, you know, exercise, whether that's food, there's, I mean, in some variants, I feel like it's, it's, it comes down to looking at it. Unfortunately, some addictions are more severe than others. So, I mean, I think everybody's kind of got that struggle with, with something yeah. wanting to be liked, wanting to have whatever the, whatever it is, if you kind of just mm-hmm. look at your life and it's like, kind of like, where am I overly lenient in one of these areas? Um, and so again, I just, I share that because I think that it's, it's when you go back to like marijuana or these, these mood altering substances that are, that are gateway drugs, but it's also it's pot and marijuana is not what it was 25, 30 years no, ago. You know, it's, it's a all. totally different game. And like I said, it's when you're seeing people come in on a, on a daily basis now that are, that are literally if, 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 if rewired their brain potentially mm-hmm. forever, depending on what it is that they've struggled with and they're not coming out of it, yeah. you know? So it's 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 awareness, right? Yeah. They're having understanding around that. And um, there was there was a statistic you shared on the other podcast I listened to about addiction and like leading cause of death. Yeah, addiction is the leading cause of death in America for 50 year old individuals and younger. That is, and have you seen an uptick in that since the pandemic? A hundred percent, basically. You look at all the graphs, all the charts, and they're all all behind by a year or two years, right? Yeah. I mean, just because they got to catch up, but it's been the last 20 years, it's just like this. Well, that's yeah. what I say. I say like on a different scale, there's a graph that shows like our prison population and how it has skyrocketed. Yeah. But there's also a same graph during that time to where you see mental health and people who struggle with mental health, obviously all these institutions like state funded, they've all, there's really none left. Nope. And so you look and the mental health, it's going down in population at these institutions, but at the same time, the prison population is going up because we're not fixing and helping people. Instead, we just throw them away. Band-aids, band-aids, yeah. band-aids. No, it's, it's, um, it's very unfortunate, you know, when you, when you look at this and it's, um, my whole theory is and just what I see and just a lot of the people I work with a lot of people I've talked to especially from COVID we're in this like slingshot mentality where I don't even think we've seen even close to what the repercussions are going to be when you take some people especially a large uh, you know a a, a specific portion of the demographic during that time you isolate them and you take them away from some of their most developmental years of their life there's going to be children that's that's what I'm referring to there's going to be astronomical repercussions from that I've even seen I'm like you see an uptick and OCD, anger, like all these now being put it back into a school overdoses, suicides. Yeah. I mean, you, you take things that are, I mean, you're actually seeing deaths that are, mm-hmm. that are, that are contributing to this and it's, they're all continuously going up and mm-hmm. it's, it's uh, and that's why I'm just grateful that we're even able to have a conversation around this, yeah. right? Is because a lot the of people land- are scared to talk about, but it. the landscape has changed too. When, even from when you're, from when you were 16, yeah. definitely to when I was 16, I mean, like I never had to worry about going out and snorting something that was going to kill, like if it was going to have fentanyl or different things. And yeah. you know I mean, like the landscape is diffed different. I mean, you got pot now laced with fentanyl. You got cocaine laced with fentanyl. You got, I mean, you got pills that look like Adderall. They look mm-hmm. like Xanax that are pressed with fentanyl. Like the landscape is just different this day and age. It and, is. And, and it's, it's like, changed. when are we going to do something about it? I had a friend of mine who like, I went from second grade to probably second to eighth grade with, but we stayed in touch, like even into our like adult lives. And he passed away from uh, getting drugs that was laced with fentanyl in LA. And sorry to hear that. the dealer that did it, obviously the police know, but it's just, there's so much of it that it's like, what, what do we have to do to stop? Well, my biggest concern too is, is like, look, there's, there's again, accident over. I'm so sorry about your loss. Yeah. And, and, but there's still a large consumer of straight fentanyl. Mm-hmm. And we always talk about how much fentanyl is here, how much fentanyl is here, right? Like, which, yeah, let's bring light to it. But my biggest question is, is why is the demand so high? 
Why are mm. so many people wanting to? I have not to, heard that question. Why are so many people wanting to escape? And like, I think it's a looking at it at a much bigger level. Yeah. Um. And 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 I actually was one of my dear friends who's high up at the DEA. I asked him that question. Yeah. It's like that's an interesting perspective. Is because we talk about how much is here. It's like again, it's like we obviously we're losing the war on drugs. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's you got to look at it at a different way. And it's if you got that many people are wanting to use something that is that just totally takes you out of context, like it's something we got to look at. Yeah. Well, you know? it's a friend of mine, Colton Underwood, who was The Bachelor. He came on my podcast and he spoke about how he just spoke in front of Congress not long ago about mental health with and you know with athletes that's what he focuses on because he played college football professional football and he spoke on that and he was like when are we gonna start paying more attention to mental health because we're not a hundred percent and i think it's important again i think to create systemic change it's creating the conversation having the conversation but mm -hmm. we need people need to be more actively involved even at a governmental level that yeah. can get more engaged with this process because again we need, we need solutions mm -hmm. so now today 2023 what are you doing to tell us about kind of what you're doing to give back and to guide and mentor and yeah so i mean from a, a work perspective which directly correlates in his hand with that i uh am the director over at the change your brain foundation with dr amen which has yep. been absolutely incredible um i work with uh, the first ever jaco accredited at home treatment provider which is a concierge treatment center which basically they provide treatment to the individual in the comfort of their own home. Wow, that's um, awesome. Which is has been incredible. Uh, I serve on the board of Cure Addiction Now with Nancy Davis. Um, uh, she founded that. She's also the founder of Race to Race MS, and she's created 24 FDA approved medications for MS. And basically she's stealing the model from Race to Race MS and incorporating that within addiction. So we literally have 10 to 12 researchers right now from Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cedar sinai Mount Sinai. We're finding studies to look for cures for addiction. We've already found uh, one one narcotic uh, one non narcotic sleep aid Balsamra that reduces cravings in, in opiate addicts by fifty to eighty percent. Wow! We're basically, removing the molecule that uh, reduces the craving, doubling it, keeping the sleep component the same to see if we can get it to eighty to one hundred percent. So some fascinating research going on there. Uh, and then um, I'm doing a lot of stuff here in Tennessee. Uh, I actually did a PSA. You guys have moved to Nashville. We're here in Nashville, you know, or actually we're in, we're in Franklin, but um, we're in Tennessee and. Uh, you know, we've, we came here and, and I got, you know, I got to know some of the mayors and I got to know some of this, you know, the, the city officials, the, the health department, the prevention coalitions, and, uh, you know, my heart's just in giving back. Um, you know, I, that's a, a big part of, of what fills my cup, um, is, okay. is, is, is giving back and, and, and not looking for anything in return. And, um, you know, we did a PSA here where we basically got all walks of life, you know, anybody from, you know, Mike Vrabel, the head coach of the Titans to the head of the DEA, you know, city officials, public figures, uh, to talk around, you know, addiction and mental health. And basically it's this platform we created is people can go and see people that they look up to or respect and see what it is that they went through or how they combat or how they deal with stuff all the way to having ACM certified doctors, which is addiction, especially, uh, their addiction, especially medicine doctors that break down, like, what is addiction? What is, what is mental health? How do I know if I struggle? What are the signs and symptoms? What do I do if my child's struggling? And so people can actually have very digestible information and in, in little clips that they can start to educate themselves to learn more and more about this. I love that because in it's statistically proven lower income households don't have the resources Correct. that someone else in a higher bracket would have. Correct. And so it feels like, okay, well, they've forgotten about me or I'm lost or, and that's the sad part because I've had so many people reach out to me and they're like, but we don't know what to do. We don't. And that that's the heartbreaking part. So I'm like, well, I wish I could save everyone. Yeah. You know, but well, and again, it's, it's, the, but having these conversations, providing those, those resources, I highly would advise for people that are going through that are wanting just to learn more or just get a better understanding of what addiction and or mental health is, especially if your child or loved one is going through it, you know, you are not alone. TN, mm -hmm. uh, uh, dot com. Uh, or dot org. I should look that up. I should know that. But uh, <laughs> you are not alone. TN dot com or org. Um, it's uh, it's an incredible resource. And then you know there's <clears throat> there's a lot more that is becoming available for people to be able to go. But by talking about it and creating discussion, letting people know they're not alone allows them the opportunity to feel connected. There's a sense of safety, and then there's an opportunity for help. So what's one thing <clears throat> that you wish someone would have said to you? 
<laughs> There's definitely, it's not mine. What is it? It, it tastes like, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Sorry about that. <laughs> he just like. Uh, at first I was like, um, but it worked. Whatever it was, man. <laughs> All good. Hit me with whatever it is I'm wishing. You know what that reminded me of is the what? moments when I used to fill water bottles with vodka and it was the, like, I would think it was water and yeah, I take a swig. Be, oh. I was like, uh, it wasn't definitely not alcohol, but it was like very lemony waters. <laughs> but you know when you're expecting water and you're yeah, like, uh, this, uh, is this is not it. That's amazing. Uh, sorry about that. It's like, <laughs> Hey, Savannah, we're all good, man. Hey. So what is, I'm going to have you answer this from two different perspectives. <laughs> okay. As someone who was struggling with addiction what is something that you wish someone would have said to you you know i i think i think everybody did everything they possibly could mm -hmm. <clears throat> back then um and so i i honestly I, there's not something that i wish somebody would have said if i could have spoken to myself mm. i would have said you know you, you you're 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 not you're not weird. You're not, you know, you're, you're not a loser. Uh, you know, you, there's, there's hope in this process. Uh, be open and be honest and, and, and know that you can get through this. I think mm. it would be, it'd be self-reflecting and talking to myself because there was so much just isolation that yeah. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to make sure that it, like I was perceived a certain way. And it was like, I, I jeopardized my own well being. I'd say, don't jeopardize your own well being on behalf of others. Mm. It reminded me of, I think Kendall Jenner did it with Dr. Amen, an interview. Yeah. And I think during that interview, she said she was speaking with her therapist and her therapist was like, but would you say all those things to the little girl you? And she was like, she sat there and her therapist was like, I want you to go through and find a photo of you as a kid and put it up on your mirror. And every time you think of saying something negative to yourself, say it to her. And Kendall was like, I, I can't do that. I, God is my witness on my, uh, in my bathroom, I have a little picture of me in my fifth grade. No way. Yeah. That is, so is that is. There's a component to that. I actually even flipped, flipped the script when I first got sober. I also had my favorite mug shot <laughs> and, and an eight by 10. Uh, in my toothbrush drawer, like yeah. when I was first getting sober, as a reminder of where I didn't want to go back to, I looked like yeah. it was like my Mel Gibson mug shot where I, I mean, it was just, it was, it was gnarly. Uh, but I had, there, there's something correlation. I'm a very visual person. Yeah. And so I literally had that there for my first year of sobriety. <laughs> so wow. every time I open my drawer, I mean, you know, brush your teeth every day. So I'd see it a couple times a day. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> but no, I actually found, uh, a couple of years, it's been like three years now I've had, I, and it wasn't anything, it was besides just a reminder to what you're talking about. I have just this, this little, it's not like in a frame this is yeah. a, a little wallet size photo that I just have by my, uh, on top of my, my by my sink mm -hmm. and uh, just a reminder, you know, it's. That's you know, amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, That's it's amazing. It's powerful. It's powerful. So before we finish, what is one piece of advice you would give to family, friends, significant others of someone that's struggling with addiction? Uh, I would say, look, you're not alone. Um, you know, there's a lot of other people going through this process and the best thing that you can do is be open and vulnerable. And, you know, by expressing vulnerability, it creates humility and it allows you an opportunity to connect with other people that are going through the same thing. So reach out. That's amazing. That's awesome. Well, I cannot thank you enough. This is fantastic. Just, like, showing up, being here. Yeah. And hey, guys, I've told Jason he and his wife need to have a podcast. So I'm going to keep hammering that one because <laughs> maybe in the future, <laughs> maybe in the future. Maybe. No, you guys are awesome. I love following y'all on social media and I'm having her on next. Yes, you should to 100%. have just a different perspective because she and I are very similar in the codependent side of things. I went to onsite. Yeah. And great program. that is, I'm like, have all my codependency things or like you do realize that like, Oh no, you, are very you and Ashley, you and Ashley got to talk and she, and her, she is, it, it's amazing what she's been able to do for herself and, and well, for yeah, cause her, not only is she like, she's done work on herself, but we were talking coming in. I'm like, she's a freaking awesome mom, business owner. Like she has a salon here in Nashville. Yeah. She doesn't, she have her uh, hair accessory line. Yeah. She's got her hair. She's yeah. got, she's, uh, 
Uh, it's Wonder Woman. I don't know how she does it. I married, but I married above my pay grade. You know? <laughs> I love I don't that. Know how she do, does it all, but she I does. I love it. Awesome. Yeah, she's well, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me.